I want to begin with a very brief prayer text uh, this morning of someone you've actually encountered in the reading by Ruth Duck in passing, Janet Morley, a Church of England uh, theologian who many years ago now rethought uh, some of the traditional collects. And I want to choose one that uh, focuses on the theme of table fellowship with God. Let us pray. O oh God, at whose table we are no longer strangers, may we not refuse your call through pride or fear or a sense of unworthiness, but approach your table with confidence to find our home in you through Jesus Christ. Amen. A couple of preliminary remarks before I move into the heart of the presentation uh, today. The first one is simply that we look at a Christian ritual celebration today after we looked at baptism, uh, one that is also broadly understood as a sacrament throughout the history of the church. So there is no uh, big discussion and trouble about considering both baptism and Eucharist as key sacramental rituals. Um, like baptism, it has a, that clear sacramental pattern I try to outline. It has materiality, very obvious materiality, although what kind of materiality especially is, is, comes to be contested. And then words that go with it. But while baptism happens once, we think and suppose theologically, Eucharist is an ongoing practice. And in a sense, much has been made of um, a similarity to natural life in the sense of baptism as a birth that happens only once and Eucharist as a feeding that has to happen uh, constantly to keep us alive. A note on terminology. Secondly, this is still preliminary in a sense. Um, and I refer you to Baptism, Eucharist, and Ministry, the text you read for today in paragraph one it lists a number of names, by no means a complete list, but here is just a quick rundown of possibilities. Eucharist, Lord's Supper, Holy Communion, breaking of the bread, divine liturgy, Holy Corbana, Mass, and I'm sure we could include some others. I'm simply for brevity's sake, throughout the lecture, going to refer to the Eucharist. But that doesn't mean that I don't recognize um, that other words are common in specific traditions. Other, me other words than Eucharist. Now, a third preliminary remark. And it's a confession, which some churches also consider a sacramental act. Um, but that's not the topic for today. So the confession is that many year, years ago, in a youthful theological enthusiasm, I decided not to receive the Eucharist until I'd figured out theologically 
what was happening in a Eucharistic liturgy and what exactly I was receiving or who I was receiving. Well, today I can say with utter confidence that if I had stuck to that decision, I would not be receiving the Eucharist to this day. So the long and short of that confession is a recognition at some point, and I simply want to put that out there and invite you into that recognition, that the Eucharist, um, even when we look at it in a divinity school, in a, an academic course, is not a problem to be solved, uh, but ultimately a mystery to be encountered and received. I'll come back to that insight, conviction at the end of the lecture. If today I raise more questions for you than I answer. I think that is the nature of the mystery we are talking about. We are not looking at a problem to be solved, but a mystery to be encountered. That said, uh, there are signposts about how to approach this liturgical celebration, this sacrament. And that's what I'll be mapping uh, for you, um, knowing that in just over an hour, I scratch surfaces. So throughout, I'll be pointing you to some further uh, resources. Let's begin this time with not where we are today, but with biblical roots. And I begin with the Hebrew scriptures. But the overall theme, both for the Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament, of what I will map is what I call the bread thread that runs through the Jewish and Christian scriptures. Key if we look at the Hebrew scriptures for, for our theme, this bread thread, but also arguably key for the uh, witness of the Hebrew scriptures to God's journey with God's people is that the constitutive act of God's story with Israel is celebrated in a meal, the Passover meal, which reflects, remembers God's liberation of Israel in the Exodus. So already in the Hebrew Bible, we have the heightened importance of a ritual meal for narrating and celebrating and remembering God's journey of, with God's people through time. And this is not the only uh, meal thread um, in the Hebrew Bible that is picked up by Christians throughout the centuries when they think about the Eucharist. They reread the scriptures in light of the meal Christians celebrate and pick up uh, meal traditions and bread threads prior to Jesus' uh, so-called Last Supper. So amongst some of them, um, some of the meal and bread threads that get picked up by Christians from um, the Hebrew Bible are um, two things that you see here um, uh, in uh, early Christian images. Um, Abel, Abel's sacrifice, Melchizedek bringing bread and wine. And you can see that Christians imagine these 
stories from the Hebrew Bible as pointing to the Christian celebration of the Eucharist. The altar here is central to the image and um, focuses your vision of these texts from the Hebrew Bible. And then, of course, we've already looked at this um, icon by uh, Rublev, Russian Orthodox, of the Trinity, but really retelling um, a story from the Hebrew Bible, uh, Abraham and Sarah making a meal for, sharing a meal with three messengers from God, read in the Christian tradition as pointing to the Trinity. And there are other minor, but for Christians, important um, references, let's say, to meals as signs of God's goodness. Psalm 23, God prepares a table in the face of enemies. When a Christian reads that sentence, God prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies, my cup overflows. They read this having just come or being in or looking forward to the celebration of the Eucharist. And of course in the Hebrew Bible, uh, meals are also part of the sacrificial tradition of temple worship. Pure offerings are brought and sacrificed. And this is followed by a fellowship meal. That's important to remember when we come to uh, this highly contested issue of the Eucharist as sacrifice, that for Christians reading the Hebrew Bible, there is sacrificial language connected to one of the meal traditions in the Hebrew Bible. Okay, we come to the New Testament and the ministry of Jesus to begin with. And starting very broadly and basically, I would say that bread, a bread thread, runs through the Jesus story as the Gospels record it. And we can begin, uh, for example, with the place where Jesus was born, Beit Lechem, Bethlehem, the house of bread. Now that may be total coincidence, but when Christians read the New Testament, in a sense with the bread thread in mind, the fact that Jesus comes out of the house of bread is intriguing. Let's leave it there. And of course, uh, the bread thread continues uh, in Jesus' life, uh, especially his meals with disciples. Not just one, but repeatedly the Gospels tell us that Jesus shares meals with his disciples and, importantly, also shares meals with sinners and outsiders. As a symbolic act of proclaiming God's coming reign, the hungry will be fed God, God's self, will provide. In John, the Gospel according to John, that is, we have a peculiarly emphatic expression of this bread thread in Jesus' life. 
although John doesn't have a Last Supper so-called institution of the Eucharist, John 6 is an equivalent uh, uh, long gospel passage where Jesus ends up feeding people and then identifying himself as the bread of life, one of the key I am sayings, I am the bread of life. Um, in a footnote, scholars have argued, and I gladly agree with them here, that uh, Jesus is here hearkening back, and I'm not guessing whether consciously or unconsciously, or whether that this is a Johannine way of reading Jesus, to a particular, a particular theme connected to Lady Wisdom in the Hebrew Bible, uh, the book of Proverbs, especially chapter 8, where Lady Wisdom, so uh, um, feminine, uh, presence of God, wisdom, chokhmah is feminine in Hebrew, uh, Lady Wisdom is imaged as preparing a meal and inviting everybody. Wisdom has prepared her feast, um, she has laid the table, she has sent out her servants to call everybody, come to the feast essentially, I'm paraphrasing. In a later apocryphal uh, recapturing of this theme, Lady Wisdom saying, come I will feed you, it is wisdom itself that is consumed. So from host, Lady Wisdom says, come and eat me, feed on wisdom. In other words, you move from host as the person who invites to, and this only works in English, host as the piece of bread one consumes. But that's on, on a footnote. For now, uh, Jesus in John's Gospel clearly um, names himself the bread of life. And this is a good point at which to just flag for you um, that in the elements of the Eucharist, in distinction to the element of baptism, which is water naturally occurring, in the Eucharist we have a confluence between the gift of the earth, grapes and grain, and the work of human hands. So when you step back and look at this picture, here is the grain, but Christians don't eat grain at the Eucharist and grapes. So there are labor intensive processes actually, human labor intensive processes behind both these elements. For grain to become bread um, takes labor, and similarly for grapes to become wine. Maybe I'll add in here that we also need to read this bread thread in, in the New Testament, in Jesus' life, um, in the context, his cultural context, which was one of um, food insecurity and subsist subsistence level economies for many people, probably most. So bread means nothing close to what it might mean in our context today. Um, it means 
basic survival. And I should also add, when we look at human labor involved in bread making in the context of Jesus' time, uh, it seems to have been mostly the task of women. It was a communal task. Uh, communities had communal ovens that you take your loaf to, to bake. And it was labor intensive. So when you hear Jesus saying, I am the bread of life, you, you need to keep that context in mind. OK, a couple of other uh, details from the Gospels that are uh, important. Um, Meals figure in the parables as a sign of celebration and joy and homecoming. Think of the father of the lost son hosting a banquet. Um, there is a petition in the Lord's Prayer. Give us today our daily bread. Sounds easy in English, but the Greek actually is complicated. Um, the word for that is translated in English as daily is a hapax legomenon. It, it appears only once. And so how exactly to translate the bread for today, the bread of today, ton aton ton epiusion, that has kept exegetes awake and interpreters of what we do when we say the Lord's Prayer. What exactly are we praying for here? I leave that to the side. That's another uh, lecture or another whole course, actually. But we are back to the, the issue I raised se some sessions ago of translation and meaning and how liturgy transports um, issues of language and has it embedded in it since earliest times. Okay, finally we come to probably where you thought I should have gone immediately and the only thing worth talking about, but I don't think so. It's the meal before Jesus' arrest and death, which in some biblical texts is linked to the Passover meal, to the Jewish Passover meal. Uh, namely in uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and in 1 Corinthians 11 also. Um, the latter actually is probably the earliest account we have of that meal in terms of written texts, because 1 Corinthians as a text we have predates probably the writing, at least, the written down texts in the Gospels. Just uh, one thing I always find important to remember when we think of um, the Last Supper, and the tradition, of course, reads the Last Supper in a peculiar way. Here is a, uh, an image from a high altar, um, the late medieval Carthusian monastery of Miraflores in, in Spain. Um, my interest here is really in something that I didn't take a good photo of. Whoops! And it is Judas. Um, so the act of Jesus uh, naming himself as food is also the act of an act of ultimate betrayal not by Jesus, but it has betrayal of those who are at the table inscribed into it. Theologically, I think one can take comfort um, in that. OK, that's all I'm actually going to say um, about the Last Supper for now, because what's, what becomes important is um, how early and earliest Christians read um, that evidence. Um, I should add into the list of bread threads 
a, a last important element, namely that there are post-resurrection appearances in meal settings. So Jesus appears to his, his disciples um, after his resurrection repeatedly in meal settings. And not only in the Gospels, well, yeah, especially in the Gospels. Uh, think of something like uh, Luke 24 um, on the road to Emmaus, the two uh, disciples on the road to Emmaus. But the long and short, the summary of this is that there is a strong bread thread, a strong Eucharistic thread to Jesus' life. That, of course, uh, bleeds into the practices of the early Christian, earliest Christian communities of faith. And so we simply see in Acts and in uh, 1 Corinthians that the earliest Christian communities continue meal fellowships. With the Didache, which has now come up many times, again a text that predates many of the other New Testament texts, we actually have our first concrete instructions of what to do at these meal fellowships. So in chapter 9 of the Didache, you have instructions concerning the Eucharist. This is a quote, give thanks this way. And then there is a prayer first over the cup and then over the bread, and then a prayer for after the meal. Scholars debated for the longest time whether this was a Eucharist or an agape, th that those distinctions uh, for the most part are, I th are now thought to be not that helpful. Um, that brings me to a great resource in your Historical Foundations of Christian Worship, which will be the key text for the second part of the semester. Andrew McGowan has a very brief, superb historical sketch of the Eucharist. Uh, so highly recommend it. A second text I want to flag that is important is um, Justin Martyr. We are in the middle of the second century uh, with him. The text is from about 160. This is an expat theologian from Syria, but writing in Rome. And for the first time, we have an image or a narrative of what this Eucharistic gathering of Christians looks like, a choreography in a sense. And it's very basic, but in a sense, we've kept to that structure, we being Christians throughout the centuries, um, until today, really. So Justin Martyr tells us that first, I mean, people gather, granted, then scriptures are read. And Justin Martyr already thinks of both Hebrew scriptures and texts that make it into the New Testament. Testament canon in the end. He says that, that there is a sermon followed by intercessions, a kiss of peace, a presentation of bread and cup, so bringing bread and wine, 
then a great thanksgiving prayer over bread and wine with the congregation at the end saying Amen. And then a sharing in the elements. Interestingly, just a footnote again, it Justin also says that the elements are taken to those Christians who cannot be present. Here you have the earliest, in a sense, a pointer to why some Christians ended up believing that the presence of Christ continues in the elements after the Eucharistic service itself. Now note that Justin doesn't say it, the, the elements are taken to those who are sick. He says the elements are taken to those who cannot be present. A couple of things to note uh, from Justin's text. Justin envisions there being a presider to whom belong an, the opening prayer, the sermon, and the Eucharistic prayer, the prayer over bread and wine. He almost certainly thinks of a bishop as the presider, but it's not clear. Uh, second, the occasion for Justin is Sunday as the first day of the week. Remember that this was a work day at the time in Rome, and so those who could not be present were actually probably those who were working. And then thirdly, I want to highlight um, a theological explanation that Justin offers that is important um, for later Eucharistic theology as it develops. And this is what he says. Oh, I'll just give you a second to read it yourself. It's boring to have stuff read to you, or is it hard to see it? Well, maybe actually I should read it since we are recording. Okay, for we do not take these as common bread and common drink, but just as Jesus Christ our Savior had both flesh and blood for our salvation, so have we been taught that the food which is given thanks over by the prayer of his word and from which our flesh and blood by transformation are nourished is the flesh and blood of the same Jesus who was made flesh. This text is very interesting because there is a lacuna here. Something is missing and something else is emphasized. Um, Justin seems to emphasize the Johannine red thread, and not just bread thread, but flesh thread. The word becomes flesh and blood. What the lacuna that isn't there in Justin Martyr, at least not in that uh, snazzy uh, quote, is any reference to the Lord's Supper. It's all about Jesus in his incarnation becomes flesh and blood for us in sharing bread and wine we our own flesh and blood is nourished by Jesus's flesh and blood mm. Okay, I don't want to say a whole lot about the so-called apostolic tradition. Ruth Duck analyzes that in quite uh, some detail, except to say um, that the text you have in the apostolic uh, tradition is um, 
might never have been used. It might be a literary text only. It is specific, not just any Sunday Eucharist, but it comes in the apostolic tradition in the segment about the ordination of a bishop. And so rather than assuming, as was assumed when I studied uh, uh, liturgical studies, that this is the first Eucharistic prayer we have, and we then thought it was from t about 215 and written by Hippolytus, you can scrap all that. Um, at least by newest insights, I'm sure further insights will develop um, in the coming years. But for now, um, let's assume it's uncertain from when this text might be, three, third or fourth century, and it might be a literary construction only. Not only, um, because what it probably gives us is um, an ideal vision of what a good Eucharistic prayer would look like. And um, let me just think for a second about whether that is this is the best time to introduce some of the terms that are in your vocabulary quiz that have to do with the Eucharist, but I think I won't. I'll do that when we get to um, the Lima Liturgy. Probably the most important thing from a, a historical sketch, and mine is ultra brief and only fo focused on the first few centuries, I'll get into some of the complex later issues when we look at theological uh, struggles, which is next. But the most important thing to get into our heads um, about early developments, Eucharistic developments, is that contrary to what many of us probably have in our heads, and um, it's a good narrative, namely that there is a direct line between Jesus' Last Supper and what we do today, there is instead uh, historical studies tell us that there is no one apostolic core way of doing Eucharist. And Andrew McGowan's book uh, on ascetic Eucharists was a uh, uh, flagged that in particular ways. There is only a plurality of possibilities in early times, out of which different families of um, doing Eucharist develop. Now, let's look at theological themes and struggles and we'll unravel some of the, what happens with these pluralities of possibility uh, in time. Again, BEM on the meaning of the Eucharist is a good text uh, to move along with. As a footnote, it's, it's odd, well, it is what it is in a sense, but that BEM comes up with five biblical meanings of baptism and also comes up with five core biblical meanings of the Eucharist. I don't know what it is about the number five that made that so uh, compelling, but I just note that um, both in the baptism section and in the Eucharist section we have this uh, list of key theological themes and there is some um, not overlap but they talk with each other in a sense, these themes. <clears throat> 
this may actually be a good time also to uh, uh, hand out the, uh, the piece of paper. We are going back to ancient technologies here of uh, handouts in class. Um, but I want you to have this text as a, as a record, not just on a screen, but on paper. What is traveling around is the text of the Eucharistic liturgy that was celebrated in 1982 when the BEM document was uh, uh, signed, let's say which is not really a liturgical act, but um, there was a liturgy that was celebrated as a sort of, here is one way of showing how the themes that we have outlined theologically can be um, displayed in a liturgical prayer. In that sense, it's almost akin to the apostolic tradition that you say, here would be one great way of doing it if your power is of extemporaneous prayer and your recall of everything that would be good to have in a prayer of thanksgiving over bread and wine aren't that convincing. Take this text. So, oh, I need a copy myself. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, BEM be begins with what is the overarching theme, really, of the prayer over bread and wine. And this is narrowly what we are focusing on now, not the whole Eucharistic service, but the prayer over uh, the elements, bread and wine. And the key claim and key insight here is that this uh, prayer is a thanksgiving, hence the name Eucharist. Uh, to this day, if you want to say thank you in Greek, you say Ephyaristo, I thank you, I Eucharist you. So it, it's simply uh, thanksgiving. which becomes, of course, the term, or can become the term for the whole service, but is also the term of a particular element of the Eucharistic prayer. And typically, it comes already in what is the introductory dialogue, technical term, and I'll take you through some of these technical terms that the uh, scholars of liturgy use to talk about the Eucharistic prayer. This is secondary uh, tools, but they are useful uh, uh, to have. And if you find yourself in a Eucharistic service anytime soon and happily think, oh, this is the anamnesis, and wow, I just discerned this is an epiclesis. Um, that's wonderful. Please don't let it disturb your entering into prayer uh, too much. So we begin with thanks. the theme of thanksgiving already present in uh, the introductory dialogue, which, by the way, going back to the apostolic tradition, is already there in this early text, almost verbatim. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. And then the Eucharistic prayer launches into, uh, depending on which tradition you're in, which texts you're looking at, the thanksgiving over and celebration of God's work of creation and redemption and the coming of God's reign. Typically, the Eastern Eucharistic prayers have a much fuller a prayer of thanksgiving. The Latin West, in part because of Latin, it's a very terse language, 
um, the Latin West goes a slightly different uh, route. But if you look, for example, at um, the Lima liturgy in what could be called the, the preface, not this comes from the Latin terminology. Prefatio doesn't mean preface as the English word. Um, so, uh, meaning in English, contemporary English, it's something that comes before the really important stuff. <laughs> so, um, the, the prayer of thanksgiving as, a, as the dominant way into praying over bread and wine in the Eucharist. Um, Christians don't invent that. It's a fundamental act of praying in the Jewish tradition that you hallow by thanksgiving. So the, the Hebrew term for this is burakah. I'm not sure we put that, we left that in that we didn't. Wow, lucky everybody here. Um, uh, a burakai is, is a prayer of hallowing through thanksgiving. And Jews pray it to this day, not only over bread and wine, but over almost anything. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam. Blessed are you, Lord our God, sovereign of the universe, for uh, the fact that the rain has stopped. Uh, you are good to all those who are late to class and have to run through the weather. Uh, in um, the Lima liturgy, actually, this prayer tradition of, of blessing God is taken up in something you don't have uh, on this sheet. It comes before the introductory dialogue, um, uh, it, and it's prayed at the moment of preparing the gifts. I should say that this preparation of gifts, um, in a sense, is a simple um, household, household matter task. You have to bring bread and wine into the middle of the assembly. But it ends up being one of these spots, liturgical spots, that take on a life of their own and and take theological flight in some traditions. Just put that out somewhere. Now, um, Thanksgiving. Oh, did I tell you that prefatio really means proclamation and not preliminary stuff? I've told you now. Um, I Just to give you an example of a beautiful Thanksgiving. Sorry about the misspell. Um, the Coptic Eucharistic prayer of Saint Basil has this beautiful text. It is fitting and right, fitting and right, truly it is fitting and right. I am truly Lord God existing before the ages, reigning until the ages. You dwell on high and regard what is low. You made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Father of our Lord and God, Savior and Savior Jesus Christ, through whom you made all things visible and invisible. You sit on the throne of your glory. You are adored by every holy power. Very different flavor from the Latin Western tradition that is concise. The Latin typically wouldn't repeat three times. It is fitting and right, fitting and right. Truly it is fitting and right. But that's a different understanding of language. Um, in the Latin West, um, beauty comes to be construed as conciseness. In some other languages, beauty is piling on repeated affirmations. Anyway, that's, I'm getting off my hobby horse here. Let's move on. The, the Eucharist second. Oh, 
maybe it's important in the prior, uh, under the prior category, simply to acknowledge that for much of Eucharistic history, for better or for worse, the Eucharistic prayer is addressed to God the Father through Jesus in the Holy Spirit. You can argue with that, uh, but historically that's what you will uh, notice. This is a good moment actually also to introduce you to a great collection of prayers of the Eucharist from earliest times uh, through 16th century reformations to the newest edition might have the Lima liturgy in it actually. Um, so if you ever want to consult actual texts of Eucharistic prayer, uh, prayers of the Eucharist, no it doesn't have the Lima liturgy, it says early and reformed, prayers of the Eucharist in various editions, the newest one is from just a few years ago, is the best collection in English of, for primary texts. Okay. Um, second, the Eucharist as anamnesis or anamnesis, depending on uh, where you get your pronunciation from, or memorial of Christ. Uh, yes. Under that wonderful notion, there are two highly contested theological thorny issues hidden. The question of how to think the presence of Christ in the elements and the sacrificial nature of the Eucharist. But first, a closer look at the term anamnesis. I think Doug makes this point well, I could make it even stronger. This is a good biblical term, taken directly from the command of Jesus, do this in memory, ace anamnesin, in memory of me. We have to read this against the background of the Hebrew root of the Greek term, Zikaron, this is not just a way or a concept of calling to mind, thinking back, mentally revisiting, but it is a, a, um, a concept of making present, bringing into the here and now, actualizing and realizing. So when at least in the biblical world, we think of making memorial of Christ. It is not, oh, I now think back 2000, what happened 2000 years ago. It's rendering present, actualizing. And in that sense, Eucharist is a memorial, not as an invitation to sit and think back what might have happened 2,000 years, but as an entering into the presencing of Christ's saving life and death. Now, if you look at the Lima liturgy and other liturgies, um, they also have a technical block of prayer that makes memorial or invites you to do that. And it's on the second page, so the back page. And it usually invokes terms like, we celebrate today the memorial of our redemption. We recall uh, your life giving everything, really. And then united in Christ's, actually, I have to um, clarify this, where it says, wherefore, Lord, we celebrate to today the memorial of our redemption. It's really not addressed to Christ. Uh, and you can see that by the way it continues. Uh, we make memorial of the birth and life of your son among us. 
It's a prayer addressed to God the Father. And then it says, united in Christ's priesthood, we present to you this memorial. Remember the sacrifice of your son, grant to people everywhere the benefits of Christ's redemptive work. That's a nice ecumenese. This is a language of its own, as you probably have realized reading BEM. A ecumenese way of both saying the word sacrifice and at the same time clarifying for this particular uh, a liturgy that it is not anything having to do with, but nobody believes that anyway, uh, although some traditions sound as if they do, um, it has nothing to do with thinking that we, there is a re-sacrificing of Christ. It's a making present the once and for all sacrifice of, of Christ. Typically, the anamnesis, uh, liturgically, um, as a technical uh, term, consists of two parts, a statement of memorial and a statement of offering. And the Lima liturgy explicates that nicely. Mm. What time is it? Shoot. I knew I had too much material. I'm struggling with what to fit in and what to let go. Okay, uh, two things just to flag. Um, yes, the issue of sacrifice and in which sense to understand the Eucharist as sacrifice has been contentious in the history of Christian communities. I think ecumenically nowadays it doesn't need to be anymore. And baptism, Eucharist, and ministry charts a possible path there. The other contentious issue is how to understand theologically Christ's real presence in the Eucharist. And that of course is and remains uh, a complicated theological issue. It may not be as you receive the Eucharist, but for theologians, how to understand this and clarify this mystery is, is a big task. I would say this, biblically it seems to me very clear that Jesus fuses his own presence with bread and wine. And the way I read the gospel, certainly not infallibly, uh, Jesus only does that with one other uh, element in human life that he says this, me, and it is the poor and disenfranchised. Whatever you do to one of those you've done to me, this, me. Um, but it certainly is also true with bread and wine. Um, it is important to acknowledge theologically that in different churches um, the presence of Christ is more or less intensely linked with the elements. And you can situate yourself in, in that uh, range of more or less closely linked. As you've probably all figured out by now, I come out of a tradition or have owned a tradition now that links it very closely. Um, BEM, the commentary to paragraph 13, um, names that, simply that fact, that in different Christian communities, the, the presence of Christ is linked more or less intensely with the elements. That has con consequences for Eucharistic celebration. 
Uh, so it's not only theologians sitting in their offices thinking about this. It has consequences for a Eucharistic celebration. I remember when I studied in Geneva at the Reformed um, Calvinist faculty there, we had a, a celebration of the Lord's Supper and um, the, the element was a baguette, a French bread. Um, so in the service it was um, broken and shared. And then we had uh, at someone's house um, a dinner and the baguette uh, reappeared there and had we put butter on it. And of course as a Catholic <laughs> I had to swallow uh, and say, okay, um, you need to inhabit this differently from uh, uh, what your upbringing taught you about Eucharistic elements, think afresh. But the long and short here is that these theological decisions have liturgical ramifications. So we need to pay attention. Okay, third invocation of the Spirit. And again, this is an, uh, uh, an element in the Eucharistic prayer, uh, in many Eucharistic prayers. Lima is interesting in that it has two epiclesis. If you look at the text, um, there is one hidden um, after the uh, Sanctus. Um, May the outpouring of this spirit of fire transfigure this Thanksgiving meal, that this bread and wine may become for us the body and blood of Christ. So an invocation of the spirit over the elements to transform them. They don't transform themselves. Um, there is another epiclesis, and you will find that in various uh, liturgies also, um, that the spirit is invoked over those present. The, the epiclesis is important because it uh, underlines that the transformation of bread and wine are not magic automatism or a human or a natural phenomenon, but God's own gift to the church. Fourth, communion of the faithful. Three elements to highlight. Uh, just to flag that the term body of Christ has at least a double meaning. It can be the elements. It can be the church. And so Augustine's famous play with this sentence, we become what we eat, is um, appropriate here. Second, um, and this might fly in the face a bit of a congregationalist emphasis on the local congregation, but I think historically and from many Eucharistic prayers, it's clear that each local Eucharist has to do with more than the nice people gathered in a nice sanctuary. So it's not just a local event, but even the heavens uh, participate. You find that most clearly uh, at the end of the preface that moves into the holy, holy, holy. Wherefore, Lord, with the angels and all the saints, and that's kind of a lame introduction. Usually we name more than just the angels, the archangels and the cherubim and the whole heavenly host. And in some Eucharistic prayers, um, like the liturgy of St. James, you name the whole of creation as joining you in uh, the Sanctus. So there is more than the nice body of human beings in one place. Uh, involved in the Eucharist. Third, 
Um, there are ethical implications in God becoming bread for us. We are to become bread uh, for others. I want to flag one recent book that is um, startling. Uh, Mary McGann writes on Eucharistic eating and the global food crisis. So she ref she's a scholar of liturgy reflecting on how our practices of eating uh, always happen in a context of, in Jesus' time, food insecurity, in our time, a global food crisis where a small part of the globe overeats and the rest of the world doesn't have enough to eat. It's, it's, it's a very startling uh, book. Anyway, on to number five, the meal of the kingdom. Um, the long and short is that in the Eucharist we anticipate God's coming reign as Jesus' meal fellowships with sinners prefigured God's lavish welcome. So our Eucharist, Eucharists anticipate the messianic banquet. And in the Lima liturgy, this appears somewhere in the intercessions. Where is it? Grant that we may find our inheritance. It's there. If you read the liturgy, you will find it. Okay. How much more time do I have? 10 minutes. I also have announcements. Shoot. Okay, very quickly. Um, the celebration of the liturgy is where uh, questions, of course, theological questions have always come to the fore. So just a quick run through some of them that are relevant uh, today. Question of unleavened or leavened bread continues to be um, marking different ecclesial communities. Questions of gluten-free are uh, a contemporary issue. Uh, same troubles with the primary symbols of wine, alcohol, grape juice, water, other substitutes possible. There are questions about differing ways to receive. And of course there are continuing huge questions about who can receive. So questions of Eucharistic table fellowship, uh, just to flag this uh, for you. The majority of Christian communities, uh, Catholics make up close to 50%, Orthodox another, what, 20, or Eastern churches, probably another 25%. The majority of Christian communities do not practice open table fellowship. This is simply a fact. I'm not saying this is good or bad. There are theological reasons uh, behind all of this um, that brings me to one point already under the housekeeping notes. Um, I think I did not mention when someone asked about etiquette um, that you need to be mindful of that. If you go to an Eastern worship service or a Roman Catholic one, don't assume that you can go up and present yourself for reception of the Eucharist. You're, you would make that very uncomfortable for that community you are visiting. Because theologically, you essent they essentially have to turn you down. Even if, as kind as they are, they would love to invite you. So. Um, in recent years, of course, in some communities, 
there's also been discussion of open table communion, in other words, inviting everybody, no questions asked about baptism or Christian convictions or anything, I simply put that out there. Um, the issue of materiality, especially in non-Western contexts, continues to be an issue. What do you do in cultures where bread is not the daily sustenance and in f instead is a sign of expensive colonialist presence? Oh. Okay, I'm going to wrap this up with what might sound like a total downer, but I hope is not. And my, my um, insight is this. One could lose one's faith over the fact that struggles and questions and uncertainties abound around the Eucharist, its meanings, its celebrations, ever since um, probably the first Eucharist uh, celebrated in the earliest Christian communities of faith. So I take comfort these days in the fact that there never seems to have been a time when there weren't questions around Christian table fellowships. So rather than fantasizing about a time when the Eucharist will be surrounded by nothing but harmony and agreement, I suggest that it is better to think of Christians as the ones who continue to care about thinking about Eucharistic practices and consider them important enough to struggle with again and again and afresh in every time and place. Not with the goal of solving a problem, but with the goal of entering ever more deeply into a divine mystery that invites us to taste and see, not to figure out God's own presence in bread and wine.